Welcome to Conquering the JavaScript Interview. Uh, in today's video, we're going to make a splash with a wet and wild problem, the rainwater trapping algorithm. We're going to tackle this challenge of calculating the amount of water trapped in an elevation map, and trust me, it's not as dry as it sounds. So grab your umbrella and get ready for a flood of JavaScript knowledge coming your way. That was terrible, and I love it. So, hello, Code Monkeys. We are here with a very fun one today that I actually encountered years ago when I, I don't think I had started teaching at Covalence yet, but I was still involved in their Discord very much, even though I wasn't teaching yet. I liked helping others, surprise, surprise, why they hired me. Um, and I remember a alumni pasting a link to, hey, check out this article that links to some questions that Google engineers get asked. And I remember seeing this one in particular where it was like, again, an elevation of rocks with some cubes in between them and you were supposed to calculate how much water could be trapped in between them. And I thought I will never be smart enough to solve this. Well, lo and behold, it took me five years later to get around, uh, I mean, I've answered this one before out of curiosity and did some reading on it, but Get a load of me now, y'all, making a video on it. And it's, you know, imposter syndrome runs rampant in our industry, and it's such a disservice to ourselves to have that mentality of, I'm never going to figure this out right out the gates, because that's honestly probably not true. We can take the time to even understand a facet of our problem in front of us, and we're going to be making progress toward it towards it. Don't let perfection be the enemy of progress. Always try and approach something with, I don't get this now, but let's see if I can figure out even one tiny step. Maybe I can think of an edge case that I can return from early and that's as far as I get. That's good. At least you're starting to think about the problem at the most fundamental and lowest possible level to begin building up your understanding. So hopefully after this one, this particular algorithm won't seem so complex should you encounter it in your interviews. It's a classic question for a reason. So let's take a look at it. Uh, write a function that takes an array of non-negative integers that represents an elevation map. So don't don't worry, we're not dealing with topography here yet, or, we're, or at all, really. We're just dealing with an array of numbers, something that's been a common theme in the last couple of videos, where the width of each bar in the elevation map, so think like a 2D map of like a little hill or something like that, is 1. Okay, so they're going to all have the same width, nothing crazy there. Uh, what will vary there, the number will represent the height of said bar across our elevation map. So our function should return how much water it is able to trap after it rains across our elevation map, aka our input array. So I do not know why these are not spaced out like the rest. Hashtag professional. I feel like every video starts this way where I'm like, oh, that looks odd. I wonder why it's done that way. Probably from a copy and paste that I messed up. Okay, cool. There we go. More legible now. So we're going to have this as our input array right here, where we're going to have zero. So, okay, that could theoretically trap water. We have a one, so a block goes up by one. Then it goes down to zero. Then we have two high, then a one, then down to a zero, then a one, then a three. So you can see, like what I mean by an elevation map. We think of these numbers as the height of our current map. And that way we have to write a function that will calculate how much water will, at the three, rush down to the zero, the one, then down to the zero. So that can hold, clearly between these two ones, this zero is gonna hold some water. And then similarly, how much water can be held between a hill size of one and then a block hill size of two. So it's not going to hold two units of water because it'll rush down that side, but we can hold at least one unit of water between these. So, so far, I see at least two units of water this thing can hold. And that's how I kind of wanted to get y'all's brain thinking. And I do have a markdown diagram that will kind of show y'all a bit uh, cleaner how this looks here. So, again, this one seems particularly complicated, but when we break it down, uh, hopefully it is not too impossible to begin to wrap your mind around, right? And there's actually a ton of different approaches that you will see across other YouTube videos, Stack Overflow posts, Reddit posts, blogs and articles and LinkedIn's and all that kind of fun stuff. All the media out there, you're going to see different kinds of approaches. If there's interest in more than what I show in this video, as always, get in the comments down below and make sure to let me know and I'll get around to making some videos on it. But I'm going to take the approach of the most common ones called the two-pointer approach. We've actually used pointers in previous videos in this series, so hopefully they're not too much of a 
foreign concept, but I will be breaking it down for a beginner and not trying to make sure that you, I'm like, hey, just go watch those old videos if you want to know what pointers are. I ain't going to do it again, all right? I'll, I'll teach y'all again, right? So we're going to be moving a left and right hand pointer to the center, and along the way, we're going to be calculating how much water can be held and incrementing and decrementing our pointers as we go until we get to the center, which means we can traverse this array one time. So we're going to compare the heights of the bars and update our maximum heights encountered so far, and based on that, it determines how much water can be trapped between the bars. I'll give you an analogy for that in a second. But if you're interested, there are other approaches. There's a uh, a stack-based approach utilizing a stack to keep track of the increasing and decreasing bar heights, iterates over the bars, uh, and then it pops bars from the stack, calculating the trap water based on the heights and distances, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you can do a dynamic prob uh, programming approach, and, a, and I think there was one called a two-wall approach as well. But like I said, if there's interest in those, I'll go to them, but I'm going to go, I'm going with the one that made sense to me when I finally kind of figured this algorithm out and how to mentally even begin approaching it with pseudocode, let alone the actual JavaScript code, okay? So we're going to be taking the two-pointer approach. I think it's one of the most relatively simple to understand and implement, which is very important when I'm teaching beginners how this function is going to work. Uh, it's fairly efficient. I mean, I'll talk more about it later, but it's got a big O of just N, which is awesome because you might think this will be, oh, this will easily be like an N squared or something crazy like that, Luke. No, it's just a, it's a linear line, big O of N. It's pretty cool. Uh, it's very commonly used. You're going to use that two-pointer uh, approach in multiple algorithms. We've used it in several in this series already, I believe, at least one or two, right? Um, and so because that's a widely used approach to traversing arrays from two sides until you get to the middle or anything else like that, common thing, common, a good tool to have in your tool belt that I've said in previous videos. And it's pretty versatile because you're going to have this traversing arrays, two-pointed approach, classic stuff. So uh, get used to seeing it more and more here, especially if you get into more complex based ones, right? They all now remember they all have their merits. Like I'm not saying this is the best one. I'm saying this is the one that I understood first, and I believe it's the easiest to teach here. So that's why I'm choosing to go with it. But they all have trade-offs between complexity, complexities, concepts, space, and time complexity, etc. Right? But we're gonna start with the two-pointer approach, say for like the third or fifth time at this point. All right. Uh, so before we begin coding this sucker out, let's talk analogies here because. I want to get in y'all's heads about how we're going to approach this one. Again, I've said it in previous videos, as human beings first, and then as programmers second. That way we can wrap our minds around it and already begin thinking in the correct way. So imagine you're walking in a hilly area uh, where the hills are represented by the elements of the array. So I know like a hill compared to an array, smack the microphone, hashtag professional, uh, is a vast difference in height, but imagine like, you are as an observer watching two people on two sides of a very Appalachian hilly area uh, where rainwater could theoretically go and get trapped between the hills in this area, right? That's what we're trying to calculate. So we're going to think of our two pointers, clearly a left pointer and a right pointer, as two people. Let's just call them Alice and Bob, right? Or Apollo and Percy. It doesn't matter. Pizza and car. I don't care what you call them, but we'll go with Alice and Bob. Just classic it's placeholder names, right? Lorem Ipsum names if I've ever heard them. Uh, that's going to be our two people. And the goal of them is they're going to be walking through this valley towards each other until they meet in the middle, and they're going to try and find out how much rainwater could be trapped between the hills as they traverse the left and right hand sides of this valley. So you can already tell, left pointer increment, right pointer decrement over time, and some kind of calculation we do in the middle, or as we traverse to the middle, is going to be how we calculate the rainwater. So Alice is going to start from the left hill, Bob is going to start from the right hill, and they're both going to carry a pole, okay? This is, think of this like the power pole from Dragon Ball. It's going to be able to extend and opposite of extend, shrink. <laughs> I knew that. Who said I didn't? Shrink uh, as they go along in order to help them calculate how much water they can think they can hold in these hills as they go along. So they're both carrying a power pole, and it is as tall as the highest hill they've encountered so far, meaning at initial when they both start, the highest hill they've seen so far is theoretically zero. So they both have a pole of height zero. So they're just sitting there with like a, a pole that's barely the size of their hand going, okay, we're going to initialize ourselves, throw in some programming terms, at a height of zero. As they walk towards each other, they're going to keep track of the highest hill they've encountered and adjust the height of their magical power poles accordingly. So if they've encountered a hill of size one, they're going, whoop. They're going to extend that pole to be the exact same size as that hill of one. Now, here's the interesting part. Whenever they encounter a hill, 
that's shorter than their pole, they then know that that spot can hold water because it's lower than the highest hill they've encountered so far. The amount of water it can hold is the difference between the height of the pole and the height of the hill they're currently standing at. So imagine we start at zero, and then we go to the first hill. Let's just focus on Alice. Forget Bob on the right-hand side. He sucks anyway. He's terrible at his job. We're going to focus on Alice on the left-hand side here. Alice encounters a hill of one and extends the pole to one. Okay, cool. Right? Nothing new here. Then she moves inwards once more. So the left pointer increments by one. She now hits a value of zero. Oh, my pole is currently one. My current element where I'm standing is zero. The difference between that is one, which means I can hold one unit of trap water where I currently stand. That is the logic we are using in order to determine where we can trap water with this hill, pole, goofy, face-ass analogy, but it is what it is. Uh, so that's how we're going to calculate it, right? So Alice and Bob are going to continue that process, just extending their pole to the highest they've seen so far, and then use some... Uh, and then use the difference between the highest they've seen thus far with where they currently are of how much water they can trap, okay? And what they're going to do is they're going to traverse the entire valley until they meet in the center, and the calculated total amount of rainwater that can be trapped between the hills should be calculated once they hit the center. So that's exactly what our code is about to do here. It's going to traverse the, the valley, our array, from both ends using our two pointers, left and right, updating the maximum height our poles, and calculating the trapped water along the way, okay? So let me show y'all maybe the diagram so y'all can see what this looks like real quick. Uh, ch -ch 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 -ch, super zoomed in here. Hey, righto. So this is our input array. This is going to hopefully help visualize that analogy. And again, I, these last couple of videos require a lot of setup for code that's actually not too terrible once you see what's happening. But bear with me. This is our input array, 01021013212121. And this little map here is kind of, it's like, I know it might not line up 100%, but bear with me. There are uh, 11 indices in this uh, array starting at 0 to 11, so it's 12 elements long. So we have our values of our indexes down here, indices, right? So they're not, I know they're not completely lined up, but just kind of bear with me. Uh, just kind of use theater of the mind to line them up a little bit more necessary where you need to. But we have a value of 0 at the 0 index spot, so it's a blank spot, so our pole would be 0. Let's imagine we're Alice moving to the into the middle of our elevation map here. At index position 1 is a value of 1, hence why we have a hill value of 1 right here in our diagram. Then we have a 0 at index position 2, so it's a it's a downward slope right there. Then we have a at index of 0, 1, 2, 3, we have a value of 2, hence this little mountain right here, right? This little hill. Then our 1, then our 0, then we have another 1, then we got a hill size of 3, then a hill size of 2, a hill size of 1, size of two, size of one, and it ends there at the 11th index position. So this is what I mean by our elevation map, like our 2D map of how tall these valleys and, and, and hills are. And based on that, we have to calculate how much rainwater we encounter. So again, Alice starts on the left-hand side, and her magical power pole is at zero because that's the highest she's encountered, and that's what she's initialized with. She moves in one space, and she extends her pole up one unit to say, hey, the highest I've seen so far is a unit of one. Then she moves to index position two into this blank spot and goes down. And she goes, ah, I know water can be trapped here because I am currently smaller than the height of one that I've seen so far because her pole is of size one and she's at a size of zero. She's like, hold on, one minus zero gets us a trap value of one. Cool, mark that down. Move to the next position. Ah, I'm now at a unit of two. That's the highest I've seen thus far. So I'm gonna extend my pole two units. I'm going to step down to index four. Oh, I'm sitting at a height of one. The highest I've seen thus far is a height of two. Two minus one gets us a trap value of one. Then she's going to move to this uh, spot here and say, oh, uh, the highest pole I've seen thus far up after being updated is a one. Therefore, I'm at a valley of zero. One minus zero gets us a trap value of one. And the process will continue as well as the opposite direction for our right pointer going inwards. The same logic will apply until they meet in the middle. 
wherever that might be, uh, wind up, and their calculated values should represent how much water is being held. So if we scroll down a little bit, the tildes here is what represents the trapped water that is calculated with this two-pointer method. One, two, three, four, five, and six should be the output for this function. So given this input, our output should be a six, which is what my first demonstration right here is. Interestingly enough, I don't have a diagram for this, but it should amount to nine. This diagram is not needed, but it's a one, two, three, four, and five. So basically it's a large slope with no space to trap water, which should get us an output value of zero because all the water would just slide down and out of our calculations for our elevation map. So hopefully the visualization of this helped a little bit. I know it definitely helped me when I was going through this. And now this thought process of Alice and Bob traversing the hills until they meet in the middle and calculating based on pole heights and differences will help explain this code once we get down here. Okay, so that was a lot of talking and not a lot of coding, but with these slightly more complex ones, I feel like that's the path I'm gonna have to take because talking out the pseudocode, showing some visual aids, giving y'all an analogy to keep in the back of your heads, and then finally coding it, I feel like will make the code that would otherwise seem a little bit scary, not so bad. So, you know, as always, we could have some fun here by doing the following. Uh, we're gonna be using the array's length in, uh, I think, one or two places, really. So, I'm as, you know, we can always consider calculating it. Uh, and storing it in a variable for use across our little application, our little function here, not an application, I mean, technically it's an app, but it's a function, right? In our solution, there we go. Uh, where we have the array length stored in a variable because we might, we should be using it in a couple of locations in this code, one or two at least. For example, we can have one right off the bat to say, if the length of the array is less than or equal to two, then we return a zero because there's not enough bars at all to trap water. So again, that's a quick little, uh, condition we can throw out at the beginning here that will uh, optimize this solution by saying, hey, if there's an array length of two, we, we ain't got enough space to trap no water. So it will return zero by default saying, eh, not possible. Right, so here is where it's gonna get fun. And I'm gonna initialize all these variables on an individual line to help y'all's focus and eyes match up with my thought process rather than doing a, a while I initialize six-ish variables. I don't wanna do them via comma initialization in one line. I'm gonna make them clean on a line by line basis. So, well, obviously we're gonna to have to trap some level of water and track that. We have a water variable for that. We're gonna to have to track the highest Alice has seen the pole. So this is gonna be her pole height as we go along this process. Remember, the, they haven't seen any mountains yet when they start this process, so we initialize this value at zero. Same thing for the right hand side, max zero. Then we have our two pointers, AKA Alice and Bob, starting there. And then Bob is gonna start on the right-hand side, which will be the array length minus one. Hence we get N minus one from this calculation up here, okay? Because remember, the end of the array is its length minus one for the last index position, okay? Which should be 11 for this input diagram here. So she starts at zero, he starts at uh, index 11, okay? So there is, our barrage of variables that I introduced on each individual line, just to make sure that we were all uh, on the same page here. Like, and again, like seeing all these things here. So calculate how much water, heights of the poles, where they are in the valley as they traverse it from the left and right hand sides to meet somewhere in the middle. So we're gonna be using a while loop to solve this one because while the left is still less than the right, they're gonna keep on going until they meet or cross, in which case the loop should stop because there's no point in traversing any further. So remember, they start at the ends, work their way to the middle. So we're gonna say, as long as left is less than right, we're gonna continue traversing our hill and calculating as we go. Okay. We're gonna have to have some calculations based on whether we're traversing the left-hand side or the right-hand side. So ultimately, y'all know that at some point, we're gonna be moving Alice in towards the left, and we're gonna be moving Bob in from the right, okay? So that's what this if-else logic is going to represent. Now, how do we make the determination if we're gonna be incrementing left or decrementing right? We are gonna do it as the following. We're gonna look at our values in the array. We're gonna say, hey, if the array element we're looking at at the current left pointer is less 
than the array value at the current right pointer. We're going to call that, let's let Alice make her calculation on the left-hand side. Uh, max, set the new maximum height of her magical power pole. Increment the left pointer. And we're going to have to have some logic to determine whether we are setting a new maximum or calculating water. But this is our, our logic. We're going to just say, if this value is less than right, then move Alice in. Otherwise, move Bob in. Okay? Now, we're going to have to have some logic for both of these cases, both, uh, both of these cases where we're going to have either, okay, copy, paste, just to kind of be even keel here. I might zoom out one so you can see a little bit better, maybe. I don't know if that helped at all. Um, what this is going to represent, these two cases, is, is this a new power pole height calculation, or do we recognize some water can be trapped here? So this is that this is what this logic is representing, okay? So this is the logic we're going to use, whether we are moving in with Alice or in with Bob. And these two internal if-else statements are going to represent, is this a power pole height calculation, or is this a water trap calculation? And to make that determination... If the, because this is a left, this block represents the movement of Alice on the left-hand side, we are going to say, if the array element on the left-hand side that we're looking at, the current height that we are at, if it is greater than the maximum height of the pole we have so far, which at the beginning of Alice's tra uh, traversal is a zero, uh, or for example, she traverses to one and it's currently a zero when it's initialized. So when Alice gets to this height block of one, well, the current max is zero and the new array left element she's at is a one. That is indeed true. And it's bigger than the height of the pole that she currently has, which is a zero, which means we set our new max to be that array value, okay? So this is how we calculate the height of the pole. Pole height calc, <laughs> right? That means, oh, she stepped from a zero to a one. That is the new highest peak she has seen, which means that is the, that is the new height of the pole. It extends magically and calculates that right there. In the event that she moves to the next, and then that, again, regardless of whether we change the pole height or calculate water, Right. Uh, regardless of what this condition ends up giving us, Alice moves in one more spot. So let's say she moves into the spot here to zero. Is the value where she now is zero greater than her max pole height, which is one? No, it is not. That means she has gone into a valley from her previous recorded height, which means we calculate the water by saying take our current maximum height pole of one, subtract our current uh, value in the elevation map, which is a zero. One minus zero gets us one, and that's how much water gets trapped there. Hence why we get the one tilde in this diagram that I have highlighted over here. That one tilde right there represents the calculation from her pole height left max of one to her new spot array left of zero. And because that zero is definitely not greater than one, it becomes a calculate water. So this use this uh, if statement's magic sauce again only says as Alice goes through calculate that pole height right so in this case the array element of two will be the new maximum height she's seen and that will set that left max to two then she'll go from that two down to this uh, bar of one at index position four so it's gonna say hey. She is sitting at a value of one. Is that greater than her left max of two? It is not. So she comes down here and subtracts two minus one. And that two minus one calculation gets us this, this highlighted tilde right here as the water trapped calculation. That is how it works from the left hand side. So with that logic in mind, we can do the same logic down here. We can say if the right element 
is greater than the right max, aka Bob's pole, we are going to assign that as the new height of the pole. Otherwise, we're going to calculate how much water can be trapped by subtracting the highest hill Bob has seen so far minus the current value of the hill he is at. And that right there, folks, is it. Let's go ahead and give it a whirl here. I'm going to console log these three values. And we're going to see if they work. I'm going to just copy and paste them real quick here. should just have these set up before the video sometime, I feel like. Not everyone console logs. Classic Luke moment. Let's just console log the water right here. There we go. <laughs> Easy peasy. Nothing's running. That's why I'm not seeing anything. We get the first input value. Gets us a output water of six. This one should be a nine. This one should be a zero since all the water slides off. And there you have it, folks. So ultimately, you know, the code looks confusing because of the amounts of curly braces and comparisons and these array elements and things like that. But again, hopefully with the analogy, the diagram and the definition of these variables and what they're supposed to be representing makes it less bad. Uh, that's how I felt when I feel like I first got it, honestly. But that's, that is the solution we're looking at here. So, you know, just for some other... Uh, yeah, I mean, as a, I guess as a, another quick TLDR, like as a recap, which is always, you know, especially if you want to take a pause and try and figure out how this code's really working in your head. Again, like moving each one independently can kind of help you kind of figure that out. But the function is going to iterate over the array, moving the pointers inward, and it will calculate that trap water at each step of the way. It will compare the heights of those poles pointed to by the left and right hand pointers and updates the maximum heights accordingly. So every time they get a step up from their previous max, they record that as the new max. If the height of the bar at the left pointer is less than the height of the bar at the right pointer, it proceeds the left side and vice versa. So this is just an arbitrary decision we're making of when we traverse left and when we traverse right. Right, we just say if the left value is less than the right value, move it in. Otherwise, if the right value is less, we move them in. Okay, that's, so it's, it's a decision we're making of when we're going to iterate this loop here, this while loop. Uh, the trap water is calculated by subtracting the height of the current bar. Okay, the height of the current bar from the highest maximum height we've seen so far. So, and finally, once they're done traversing, when they meet somewhere in the middle, aka okay, when the left is no longer greater than the right pointer, or less than the right pointer, it should have that calculated number of water and that right there is the two-pointer approach to efficiently solve the rainwater trapping problem. This sucker has a big O notation of, drum roll please. I think I mentioned this at the beginning actually. A complexity of big O of N, where N is the input size of the array. So it is that le classic linear line right there. Just the longer the input gets on this solution, the more operations it's going to take because we iterate over the array exactly one time because it iterates over the array elements exactly. I can't say over the array one time because we go from out to in, right? Um, so it performs a constant amount of work on each element is the important thing to keep in mind here. So time and for space, it's actually an O of one because as you can see, it uses a constant amount of additional space regardless of the size of the input array. There's no other like hash map or secondary or tertiary arrays that we are generating to calculate values here on. So the space complexity isn't big O of one. Uh, yeah, this is a this is a really fun one that I felt like was my like a stepping stone in my programming journey. Uh, that I felt pretty awesome when I understood how to approach this problem and think about it, especially with that pole analogy. But, uh, you know, I can't say this one is some awesome, crazy algorithm that you will see, like, in bigger picture type stuff. Like, some, some of the times I have uh, examples of where this might be used in the real world. This is more of a solving the problem at hand to pass your interview uh, it does help you understand pointers and how they work and how they can be a powerful tool in solving problems in a linear, big O of N, time. Uh, using multiple pointers, especially in cases when they move toward each other, can be uh, can be applied to a variety of problems you will see, again, like the last video for that, for that uh, example. Uh, 
Yeah, and I mean, you'll see this in like histograms, or I guess if you're in in topography as an engineer or something like that, this fundamental problem is something you probably have to solve early on in your university career or if you go into that kind of training. Like I said, it's not really a real world problem you're going to encounter that's this simple, but again, the concepts and techniques it teaches you are very applicable and widely used. So, you know, yeah, I mean, I imagine this would be kind of uh, normal in image processing and things like that as well. So, you know, here's a quick little rundown of the code again to look at it here. I have my three tests written as well uh, for, you know, Mocha and Chai as I build out this lovely, whoop, as I build out my lovely repository here for letting y'all test on your own time and have some fun with it. But like I said, thank you guys and gals for watching. I hope you found this video helpful in our journey to become a better developer. If you enjoyed this video, consider giving us a thumbs up, a like, and a, well, that's the same thing. I've been, have I been saying that constantly, being redundant? Eh. Uh, and consider subscribing to our channel for more videos like this. I would love to hear y'all's thoughts on this lovely looking algorithm. Uh, if you have suggestions for more efficient, optimized solutions, or if you want to, if you want videos on the other approaches, or if you want to throw the other approches in the comments and get a discussion going, that's awesome. But remember, positive and constructive comments are always welcome here. Let's keep our discussion going and helping each other improve our own coding skills. So thank y'all again for watching, and I'll see y'all in the next video.